in just 30 hours. I'm your host, Steve Ann Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our lead story today, the unthinkable will happen in 30 hours and it will change everything. It has the potential to change the course of the U.S. economy and the timing of this could not be worse. Plus, we have mounting evidence that the global economy is slowing down and the policymakers have got this completely wrong. And yet, wait till you see what one of them said today. It's outright stupidity. And when you understand that these people who are in charge of the system have absolutely no clue how it works or how to manage it, well, wait till you see what this one said. It's all the proof you'll ever need. And with that, let's head over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline, U.S. core PCE or personal consumption expenditure prices post a smallest monthly rise since late 2020. Now, why does PCE matter? Now, you heard of the consumer price index. This is pricing on the consumer side. Personal consumption expenditures, this is an in this report from the business side. Now, we know the Fed loves PCE over the CPI. Everyone really focuses on consumer prices, but here's the problem. We continue to hear from the Federal Reserve and other central bankers that inflation is going to surge higher here. It's going to look just like the 1970s, and then you get Get a headline that like this that suggests that perhaps the global economy is indeed continuing to slow despite the recent resurgence in the factory sector. The core personal consumption expenditures price index, which strips out volatile food and energy components, climbed a mere, get this, 0.1% in August. A key gauge of services costs watched closely by the Fed also posted the smallest monthly advance since 2020. Now, what should we actually be expecting here is big numbers because the Fed said they moved the, the, the line here. You may remember, at first it was a CPI, then it was a core CPI, really they're looking at the core PCE that it doesn't really matter because they strip out food and energy and said, look, core prices aren't coming down. Well, look at this. We're now seeing the smallest monthly gain. What that tells us is demand from the consumer uh, from the U.S. is going down, and that's not what we've been told. We've been hearing that wages were going to drive consumption. We're seeing just the opposite, which we've made the case on the show over and over. As inflation-adjusted consumer spending rose a mere 1, 0.1% last month on a nominal basis, that's non-inflation-adjusted, personal outlays increased 0.4%. So despite the fact here that we see core inflation falling, what do we see consumer spending more? Now, the question is, what are they spending that extra money on? Well, if you said gasoline, you got it right. Let's take a look at the services sector here because that was supposed to drive inflation and now excluding housing and energy, it rose only 0.1%. The overall PCE price index, this now includes food and energy, jumped 0.4% just on a pickup in energy costs alone. And that's the problem here. And we've discussed this over and over that high energy prices right now are the worst possible thing for the US economy and the global economy because it forces consumers to adjust their spending habits onto something and takes it away from the discretionary side. And you see that now in the PCE print. Due to energy, the headline number rose, strip out energy down to the core, only 0.1%. So it tells us consumers are strapped here. It tells us they don't have a lot of discretionary money left. And now we know, of course, it's just starting here in a matter of days, student loan repayments resume and watch all of a sudden even more hits to the discretionary side. But let's take a look at personal consumption expenditures because they really have a lot to do with where crude oil prices are. And we've got the PCE here in blue against West Texas Intermediate and Red, both on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And notably, you see crude oil go down. And with a lag, well, PCE goes down. And we see that repeat over and over. You see it in the dot-com bubble. You see it here around 2005 to 2007 as they go down together. But notably, they go up together too. Look at this during the global financial crisis. Outright collapse in crude with a lag collapse in PCE, and you see these downward trends, and I've highlighted several of them because they're consistent, and now we see crude oil prices come down. There's been a bit of a rally off those lows. On You see it here on the year-over-year rate change. It pushed up the PCE a bit, but notably, the issue here is where crude goes, the PCE will follow, and if consumers 
are forced to pay higher energy costs. They're going to spend less on other things. Spending less on those other things mean global transportation. Well, that's going to slow down. You're going to see less goods and services being moved and less demand for energy. And eventually, you'll see energy prices come back down. Now, we've made that case. Now, in the short term, does it mean energy prices can't go higher? Absolutely, they can. We saw it during the global financial crisis. I made the case during yesterday's show that we could be seeing a repeat of it only in a bigger fashion some of you commented and said yeah i agree with that it looks a lot like the global financial crisis except we've got instead of the housing issue we've got commercial real estate and we've got banks that are already insolvent not a good look of where this can go the figures reinforce our view that the Fed's inflation projections are far too pessimistic. Barring a dramatic reacceleration in the monthly pace, which we've said is not going to happen, which is also unlikely given the cooling labor market. Now, we haven't heard that from the Fed. We've heard it slowing down, but they're still optimistic about it. And the sharp downturn in housing inflation, we continue to expect core PCE inflation to fall well below the Fed's 3.7% projection for the end of this year. Now, what we do know is about these core rates these core cpi or the core pce they move a lot slower so that's actually expected and what about the labor market because this is a one thing that the fed still stands on and says is strong and robust we know there's going to be hiring going into the whole of this season but what happens next does the economy hold together well when you see pce coming down we'll tell you what goes up well, that is initial claims because all we're seeing here on the business side is demand go down. And you go back here into the late 80s, into the 90s, what happens? PCE comes down. And why is it coming down? Demand's going down. And why is it going down? Because more people hitting the unemployment line. You see it again in 2000. All of a sudden, personal consumption expenditures start to slow and come down. And notably, you see unemployment claims rise. Happens again during the global financial crisis. Starts to happen in 2018 going into the pandemic is starting to happen now but with the recent downturn in the four-week moving average of initial claims everyone's saying hey look at how robust you know the labor market is it's a function of demand and we see this again going into the holiday season it's not unusual for employers to hire up but that's okay that's good the problem is it's not sustainable because demand is coming down that's why we see the pc come down the cbi come down and i know everyone says those are going to keep going up but they're not after a burst of spending in the prior two months, the strength of American consumers dissipated in August. No surprise. Wait until we get to October here. And you also note at the end of the third quarter, what did the Fed say? The pandemic money is pretty much gone. While a resilient labor market is helping to support incomes, the cumulative effect of high prices, a rise in gasoline costs, I'll say that one's more important, and the resumption of student loan payments threaten to cool outlays. No surprise. Those developments could help to further limit inflationary pressures, but also run the risk of steering the economy closer to a recession. And that's why our headline story today is so important because at this point, you know, when the economy is teetering on the edge of a cliff, sometimes it just needs just a little bit of a nudge and that nudge can come from anywhere. And that's why we're saying that what's coming, what this coming in 30 hours, huge problem. Let's take a look at the PCE against total compensation. This is average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non-supervisory employees. What a beautiful relationship here. And, you know, this is about demand, and this is the case we're making. Everyone says the prices magically go up even if people don't want to spend. And what you see here is that did used to happen. That happened in the past. Not anymore. Not in a global economy. You can see your total compensation in red shown on a year-over-year rate of change. If consumers can't afford it they're not buying it and that means price growth slows so likely what we're expecting is the economy slows hours will get cut and next thing you know this will keep coming down as to will demand Plus, we can look at the personal savings rate that just got data on that against total compensation. And we know when total compensation tends to go down, the savings rate starts to go up. Now, you think about that as people start to get more concerned about the economy. They see the hours getting cut. They actually start saving more than when they have excess income, means they spend less in the broad economy. There's no surprise of why we're heading into recession. Again, all it needs is a nudge. I think in 30 hours, we're going to get that nudge. But we see the savings rate now starting to likely tick back up in the future. Not a good sign as total compensation heads down.
But look, this is not just a U.S. issue. This is a Eurozone as well. Look at this. Core inflation hits one-year low, backing an ECB pause. And we're going to start hearing more about central bankers pausing as we see inflation numbers start to hit new lows. But one thing that shouldn't be hitting the new low, well, that's your trading account. Because if you had both our reports, our CTA report, the looks of machine positioning, adds a historical overlay and our momentum report. You've got the dream team of reports. We've had, I've had people email me say, Steve, I've been trading for 40 years. I put these two reports together. I don't need anything else. When they confirm, I buy. It is fantastic. Those can be yours too. Links in description below. Notably, Momentum Time Pro, you get a free month. So you sign up, lock your price in at 20 bucks a month and you get a free month. What a deal. How about this 11% gain on crude? We showed you the reports when they said buy in here. And then we showed you the reports that sold here. And now this 11% gain said buy here, confirming on both reports up right now, just on this move here, 11%. Here you can see on our CTA report, August 31st, machines started buying up into that trend. There was your signal. You flip over to the momentum timer pro report. You go to the energy sector. We got two of them on here. They had three consecutive days of building momentum them between the two of them it tells you validation price goes higher all you got to do is place the trade again links in the description below but underlying price gains which strip out food and energy came in at four and a half percent in september that's down from 5.3 in august and much less than the 4.8 median estimate Headline inflation moderated to 4.3 from 5.2, an almost two-year low that was also below expectations. Here we see, led by a drop in energy costs, but with services also slowing sharply. And it's the services. That's the, the one that no one said was going to happen. If we heard, so it would be robust services demand, robust services inflation. We said, no, watch the manufacturing sector. Where it goes, services fall. And sure enough, the only thing here that's driving the CPI index is as up the way it is. It's energy prices. We know it's Russia. We know it's Saudi Arabia. But at some point, it will all backfire on them. You wait and see. What do you think? Do you think they can keep driving oil prices up, up, and up? Or do you think it's a demand issue that at some point, consumers around the world are tapped out and it doesn't matter and since prices crashing? Wait in the comments. Love to know what you think. Friday's data offers the most definitive sign yet that growth in core prices, the key metric as monetary policy was tightened, is firmly on the way down following a summer during which statistical distortions popped it up. And here we can see what is going to drive personal consumption expenditures. Now we're going to look at the core. This is excluding food and energy. This is what the central bankers don't understand. When you invert yield curves and you reduce the amount of money being created in the economy at a time when there's record debts, and then you drive interest rates up so people can pay more on those debts, well, eventually money gets chewed up out of the system and you see demand goes down. Here you can see the net percentage of banks tightening standards here against that green line. That's the baseline. Anywhere above the dotted green line, that's where banks are tightening standards, creating less money in the economy. And look at that core inflation heads down. You see it during the global financial crisis. You see it going in during the pandemic. You're seeing the early phases of it now. Our prediction is at some point, all of this is going to come crashing down because look at this, it's US, it's Europe. And now we're going to another country before we show you why 30 hours from now, the tipping point begins. Look at this here, Canada. Economic growth misses forecast. See, we have to continue to hear that backing rate pause. And we're going to hear this from the Fed too. As, as the data slows down, we're going to hear it. Preliminary data suggests gross domestic product edge up a mere 0.1% in August as declines in retail and oil and gas industries partly offset increases in wholesale and finance. The report points to an economy that's still in a soft patch as interest rate increases weigh on indebted households, we've, we've been saying is a problem, and restrained spending. It leaves room for the Bank of Canada to hold short-term borrowing costs steady in late October, despite a worsening inflation backdrop. But we're seeing inflation slow down because it's a demand issue. That's what the central bankers don't get at all. But now, 30 hours from now, is this the tipping point for the U.S. economy? Could it send the global economy down? The answer is outright yes let's see what's going to happen here from bloomberg we see white house staff told to brace for furloughs as the shutdown nears that's right we got midnight on september 30th coming fast here look at this house speaker kevin mccarthy has sought to secure enough votes in the republican controlled chamber for a stopgap bill to keep the government open which also includes deep spending cuts and stricter border and immigration policies 
backed by hardline conservatives in his caucus that he hasn't gotten it done. And here's my belief. Happy to have you weigh in the comments. I don't think they want to get this done. I think if the Republicans in the House can do something to put the economy here on pause, it sends us into a recession. We know historically on the second term in a recession, President's unlikely to get reelected. And look, all that Republicans have to do here is say, look, we tried. We tried to get something done. The other side wouldn't do it. You know, politics is a fun game when you watch what their real motivation is. Because look at this. Congressional Democrats in the White House oppose those measures. So we already know. McCarthy already knows it's not going to happen, meaning the bill has virtually no chance of becoming law. So does he give in or does he just keep going and say, look, it's not my fault the government shut down. You wouldn't agree with me. And if that is enough to send the economy into recession, it very well could be. I think that's the nudge it needs. The Democratic-run Senate proposed a bipartisan plan that would keep the government open until mid-November and provide $6 billion in new assistance to Ukraine. That measure, though, is a non-starter for House conservatives who want to halt or severely limit further assistance in Kiev and its war against Russia's invasion. So here we see a standoff. Will it go a week, a month? I don't know, but historically... These things don't last long. Here you can see, usually a matter of a day or a few, it doesn't appear that way. Some of the longer ones, under Bill Clinton, 21 days. Then under Barack Obama, 16. But how about under Donald Trump, 35 days? You imagine shutting the economy down right now for 35 days. We talk about pushing things and nudging them into recession. I think the Republicans are playing politics here. I'm not saying it's a bad move. I'm saying you got to look at the cards you're playing and try to get your, your, the president's office back. But from an economic standpoint, I think that's what their motivation here is. But look at how clueless. Now, I want you to see the Fed here. I've showed you the global economy is slowing down. We've showed you now in 30 hours, we could see a tipping point. And look what the Fed has to say about all of this. Fed's market says labor market key to assessing demand and prices. He says officials have time to see if more work is needed. Although I'm not sure that's the case. The path forward, to me, depends on whether we can convince ourselves. Now, I want you to understand those words. We can convince ourselves. What is the Fed supposed to be? If you said data dependent, you got it right. So why should they convince themselves? Shouldn't the data tell them what to do? But let's look at this again. Depends on whether we can convince ourselves inflationary pressures are behind us or whether we see them persisting. I will be watching the labor market. So now we're switching it. We're not going to look at the core CPI, core BCE. We're going to look at the labor market for those signals. And Barkin said he expects further tightening to come from the effects of previous rate hikes on the economy because, of course, they do. That's the only thing they can go by because it's all they've really done here. Nevertheless, I don't think it's all in and we're done. So suggesting maybe some more hikes. But he did say in an earlier interview that it's too early to know if another rate increase would be needed this year, noting that headwinds from a potential, here we see it, government shutdown could create more uncertainty for the economy. And if it does that, you watch, spending slows down. It's just a little nudge. I think the economy needs here. I think the Republicans are playing politics. Not saying it's a bad move, just saying this is how games work in Washington. You do what you got to do to get your party back in power. And if you can convince the world or voters that, hey, it wasn't you that caused the problem. It was the other side that didn't want to agree. Well, next thing you know, there's a recession and somebody's going to be out of the White House. Watch and see. I'm your host again, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.